Hi, it's Janice. We're going to talk about temporary transvenous pacing. Our new dual chamber temporary pacemaker allows us to do some new things and has different modes, and we'll discuss those in a little bit. First of all, what are some of the rhythms that would lead to a patient getting a temporary transvenous pacemaker? So we've already done transcutaneous pacing, and now we want to move forward with transvenous pacing. So with this top rhythm here, what do you notice? More P's than QRS's. Aha, we have a block of some sort. Then let's look at the PR interval, and what do you notice? The PR interval remains fixed and constant. So this is a second degree type 2. Our middle rhythm there, what do you notice is going on there? We see a P for every QRS, but it happens to be really slow. So this is a if this is the patient who is getting a pacer, symptomatic bradycardia. And then lastly, the bottom rhythm there, we have wide QRSs, we have more P's than QRSs, aha, we have another block. So looking at the PR interval, we notice that there is no relationship. The P waves are marching out at their own beat. You have a couple P waves hidden in the T's. And this is a third degree heart block. Prior to putting in the pacer, we need to gather all of our supplies. One of those happens to be the temporary pacing catheter with the shrouded pins and introducer kit. And you can see in this kit, not only is, does it have the pacing catheter, but it's like a central line. It has the introducer with the side port, and it also has the contamination sleeve. Where is it going to be placed? Ideally, the right internal jugular vein. We want to leave the left subclavian for the permanent pacemakers, but it's also an option. Here's what the bipolar lead wire looks like. You can see at the very, very tip, the distal end of it, you have your distal negative electrode, and then a few centimeters up from that is the proximal or positive electrode. Here we have a picture of the bipolar pacing catheter in the heart. And you can see that the job of the positive electrode, or the proximal one, is to sense the inherent myopotentials, so what's going on in the heart. And then the negative electrode, or the distal one that is coming into contact with the right ventricle, the, or the endocardium, is to deliver the electrical impulse when it's needed. So there's a few different placement methods that the physicians can use. That's the blind insertion, ultrasound, or EKG. So with the blind insertion, it's potentially very fast, but there's no ability to troubleshoot. And with ultrasound, which is probably what we'll use, um, it's safer, um, and we're able to troubleshoot and see mechanical capture. With the EKG, we're able to see the intracardiac waveforms, and we have to use the alligator clip and connect it to the distal electrode of the V1 lead on the EKG machine as well in order to see that pattern that looks like an injury pattern or almost like a ST segment elevation MI. Here's a picture of that ST segment elevation or that injury pattern that happens when the pacing electrode comes into contact with the right ventricle or the endocardium. All right, so now we've got the pasting wire in and we've pulled out our brand new temporary transvenous pacer and connected it to the box. There's a whole lot more buttons on this one than we're used to, so we'll go over those a bit. So first of all, on the top, you've got the rate and the both atrial and the ventricle output knobs and numbers. The default rate for the um, pacer is set to 80 paces per minute, and it can go as low as 30 beats per minute or as high as 200 beats per minute. And then there's the atrial output and the ventricular output. Both of those have a default of 10. And you can see that the ventricular output goes up to 25, whereas the atrial output only goes up to 20. Once the pacemaker's in the heart, we want to have 100% capture. So that means that we want to see a pacer spike and then a wide QRS if we're ventricularly pacing the patient. So in the picture above, you can see that there's a pacer spike, wide QRS for three beats, and then there's a pacer spike and no wide complex. So that does not have the output or the milliamps high enough to achieve capture 100% of the time. The output setting should be set two to three times greater than where, um, where we lose capture. So that's also called the stimulation threshold. The lower screen has three different functions. One is to select the pacing mode, DDD, DDI, 
VBI, any of those. It's to select and adjust the parameters from the pacing parameters menu. So if you want to change the sensitivity, you could do that here as well. And lastly, there's the display warnings like it's locked. The sensitivity allows the pacemaker to see what's going on inside the heart. So if you like to think of it as a fence, so the pacemaker eyeball is walking on one side of the fence and then the cardiac rhythm of the patient is on the other side of the fence. Ideally, we want that fence high enough so that the pacemaker can see the QRS. We don't want the fence to be too high because then the pacemaker eyeball on the other side of the fence can't see what's going on on the other side of the fence and it's going to think that the patient doesn't have a rhythm and it's going to send impulses and pace when the patient may not need it. Conversely, if the fence is too low, then the pacemaker can see P waves, QRSs, T waves and think that, or even artifact, and think that it doesn't need to pace when indeed it does. In this picture, you can see there's a pacer spike on the far left of the screen, followed by a wide QRS. That's good, we have capture. On the bottom, you see it says the pacing interval. You can see, again, that there's a pacer spike and then a wide QRS, so that's going along good. And then the third beat is the patient firing its own beat, what looks like a PVC, and you can see the dotted line on the bottom indicating where a, paste, a pacer uh, impulse should have been delivered but wasn't because the pacemaker saw that the patient fired off its own beat so the fence was just right and therefore was inhibited. And then moving along you see a pacer spike, wide QRS, and then again there's what looks like a PVC so the pacemaker sensed that, you see the dotted line on the bottom, and therefore did not fire a beat. And then again, it picks back up again with the pacer spike and a wide QRS. So it's doing exactly what it needs to be doing. What do you see going on in this picture? So you see pacer spike, wide QRS, times three beats, and then you see a nice rhythm with a P, Q, R, S, and T. So there was no need for the pacemaker to fire. That means the fence level was just right and the pacemaker did not send an impulse when it didn't need to. So that is great. What do you see here? You see a pacemaker spike, a normal beat, a pacemaker spike, a normal beat, a pacemaker spike, a normal beat, and then a pacemaker spike that lands on a T wave and unfortunately leads to B-fib in this patient. So that is definitely no good. The fence was way too high and the pacemaker didn't see what was going on and just fired away. These are the steps on testing the sensitivity threshold. So first of all the patient has to have an intrinsic rhythm and then gradually you would decrease the sensitivity or raise the fence while watching the pace and sense indicator lights up on top of the pacer and then note when the pacing lights start to flash and that indicates loss of sensing. And the Sensitivity is going to be set at half of this value. So if the sensing was lost at 4 millivolts, then you're going to set the sensitivity at 2 millivolts. So we have different modes for pacing. There's three different letters that we have on our pacemaker. The first letter corresponds to the chamber being paced. So uh, o would mean that there's no chamber being paced. A for atrium, V for ventricle, D for dual both the atria and the ventricle. Position two is gonna be the chamber that is sensed. So is it the atria, is it the ventricle, or is it both or none? And then the third letter corresponds to uh, the response. So what is the pacer going to do? Nothing at all, so at O. Is it going to inhibit, so not send an impulse? Is it going to be triggered? Is it going to send a pulse because it notices that it needs to, or um, is it dual? Does it doing both triggering and inhibiting? So there's two different, uh, two additional letters, and those are dedicated just to permanent pacemakers, and we're not going to go over those. All right, let's do some practice. What do you see going on here? We've got VVI. What exactly does that mean, and what do you see? So first of all, we've got the chamber. What chamber is being paced? 
it's the ventricle, V for ventricle. What chamber is being sensed? That's the second letter. And that's V for ventricle. And then what's going on with the third letter? The I stands for inhibits. So the response to what is being sensed is that the pacemaker is not sending an impulse when it sees that the patient has its their own beat. As you can see there in the middle, there was, or the third beat, that's the patient's own beat, and there was no pacer spike delivered. All right, VAT. So what's the chamber being paced? What's the chamber being sensed? And what's the response to what is being sensed? So the chamber is the chamber being paced is the ventricle. The chamber being sensed is the atria. And then what's the response to what is sensed going on in the atria? We have a triggered impulse. So here you can see pacer spike, wide QRS times three complexes, a nice long pause, and then a P wave that's being sensed, and then a ventricular uh, a pacer spike, and then wide QRS is again times three beats, and then the same thing again. Here's another one, DVI. Okay, the chamber being paced is dual, so both the atria and the ventricle. So you can see pacer spikes here in front of the P wave and the ventricle. The chamber being sensed is the ventricle, and when the pacer senses an impulse in the ventricle, it's going to inhibit the response. Last one, DDD. So the chamber being paced, that's dual, atria and ventricle. The chamber being sensed, again, that's dual, both atria and ventricle. And then what's the response to what is being sensed? It's atrial activity triggers ventricular pacing. Okay, and that's it. Thanks for listening.